If you're like me and you're getting into Xenonauts 2 having not played the prequel or having not played the original XCOM in a very long time, it can be pretty overwhelming and a lot of the assumed knowledge that you have from other tactical games like XCOM, the new ones, uh, will, will, will not do you very well in combat and also just in general with the strategic map. So this short video is just going to go over a few things that I've learnt in my early access period and talking to my community that should hopefully help you get set up and get going without making too many early mistakes. Hopefully the video is useful for you. Let me know if there's anything in here that was game changing for you in the comments below or if you already knew about it. And uh, if you like this, I'll maybe try and come up with some mid game tips a little bit further down the road when my Let's Play gets through there. Without further ado, let's have a look at some tips. The first decision you make in Xenonauts 2 is where to place your starting base. And this is actually a very important decision, especially for one of your first playthroughs as you're learning the mechanics of the game. It can be tempting to try and put it somewhere like your hometown, say you live somewhere in America or in Europe, but you need to think very carefully about the coverage that the base has, both in terms of its radar coverage and how much land mass it covers with that radar radius. If we have a look at the three circles that come out of the base, the first one shows you the range of the initial starting radar that you have when the base is constructed. The second circle is the range you'll have when you build your second radar, and the third circle is the range you'll have when you build your third radar. Getting this to cover as much landmass as possible is very, very valuable for you when you first start to play the game, especially in your first couple of playthroughs, because you need to shoot down UFOs over land in order to get UFO missions to extract the resources and get the captures and the alien bodies that you need to research. My advice would be to pick an area that gives you as much landmass cover as possible to begin with to increase your chances of A, detecting a UFO over land and B, shooting it down over land. There's nothing worse than finding a UFO, risking your interceptor to shoot it down, taking damage, and then having that UFO land in the sea where you're not able to recover the resources. Personally, I'm currently running a campaign where I have put my starting base here in North Africa, where you can see that when I've got my third radar upgraded, I will have coverage over pretty much all of Europe quite a lot of Russia, all of India, or most of India, a, a chunk of India, the uh, Middle East, and all of Africa. And then I'm planning on building additional um, ones to cover the Russian um, Chinese area of the continent, maybe one for Australasia, one for South America, and one for North America. You can be a little bit more liberal with your later bases, but your first base needs as much coverage as possible because you'll be relying on it to detect aliens for as long as possible. There are other valid starting locations, but I highly recommend you try something like North Africa for a starting one, just to give yourself as much of a boost as possible. Just a very small note, and not something you really need to rely on. When you have no research selected for your research division, and no construction selected for your engineering division, they will produce a small amount of money per hour based on how many scientists and research that, researchers that you have. It isn't a huge amount of money, but if you're needing to maybe just get a couple of hundred to, to get that research topic ready to go, you can just cancel any research you're doing or cancel any construction you're doing and wait for that money to tick up. Again, you get money monthly, so it's not something to rely on, but if you need that little push, it could just get you where you need to go. A couple of small notes on base building. One, radars don't have an adjacency bonus, so you can place them anywhere to fill in spots in your base. They also take 20 days to build and cost $400,000. I would recommend getting a radar array under construction on day one in your starting base to increase your radar range ASAP. You'll probably need to build a generator to power that, and generators do have an adjacency bonus. The access lift and the storeroom also have adjacency bonuses, which can help you when you're setting up additional bases to give you a little bit of extra storage room. Um, in order to house more engineers or laboratories, not only do you need to build an additional laboratory or maintenance bay, you also need to increase your barrack space. So barrack space doesn't just give you access to additional soldiers, it also gives you access to additional specialist workers in those areas. So if you've built another laboratory and wonder why you can't hire any more scientists, it's because you've got nowhere for them to sleep. A medical center is also a very useful one of to build in your starting base. It costs quite a lot of money, but that extra 25% survival chance is very, very good for soldiers going down in missions, which will probably happen as you get your head around the tactics part of the game. So I'd recommend getting a medical center down as well. If people are interested, I could maybe put together a video on some basic base layouts. It's something I'm still puzzling out myself. A couple of small notes on soldier stats. Hit points is literally, or health is literally what it says on the tin and end of the game, how much health your soldiers have before they go down. 
Turn units represents how much movement a soldier has getting around the battlefield. It does not affect how many attacks they could make per turn because attacks are percentage based. So if you have a unit that's not going to move around very much, it doesn't matter if they have low TU because they're still going to get the same amount of attacks per turn as somebody with vastly more TU than them. TU affects mobility, not amount of attacks you could make. Accuracy is very self-explanatory. It is how accurate a unit is. However, some weapons have a short range accuracy bonus like shotguns, so it doesn't matter too much if you have a low accuracy soldier carrying something like that. Strength affects how much a soldier can carry, how well they can manage the recoil of a burst fire weapon, and they will actually gain progress points towards increasing their strength for every movement time unit they spend when they're carrying over 80% of their maximum carry, sorry, up to 80% of their maximum carrying capacity. That's really important. When you're loading your soldiers out, just make sure that they're over 80% of their carrying capacity and all of them will get strength ups, meaning they can carry more and more into battle. It's a really, really useful thing to do. Reflexes affects whether or not a soldier will reaction fire, but reaction fire or overwatch also depends on how many turn units they have left over when you ended their turn. If a unit has no turn units left over, they will not be able to overwatch. Having a low reflex like Daniel Edwards here is not a bad thing. This soldier would be a prime candidate for carrying a grenade launcher as their primary weapon. And as the commander, you don't need to worry about leaving them with turn units at the end of their turn and having them reaction fire with their grenade launcher. It's pretty unlikely that it's gonna happen with such a low reflex. It could still happen, but it's very, very low. Bravery primarily deals with morale and panic. If your soldiers are taking a lot of damage or there's people dying around them, they will start to lose morale and potentially run away or go berserk. It also affects their ability to resist psionic attacks, so it shouldn't be ignored, but at least in the early game, it's not as important as the other stats. When equipping your soldiers for combat, be aware that equipping defender armor on a soldier will give a small accuracy penalty. It's not very large, but it does exist. If you equip the same soldier with a tactical module and they have the ability to carry it, that will mostly offset the aim penalty that the defender armor gives them. So this is minus five for wearing the armor, and this is plus four for equipping the module. Just one thing to bear in mind. If you want to give a soldier a support item or backup weapon, for example, this med kit here, be aware that it will cost you 20 time units to swap it out of their backpack and into their secondary or primary slots in combat. So you may want to maybe go in with the actual support weapon already equipped, and then when it's used up, swap out their support item rather than the other way around. When you're preparing your team to go into battle, be aware that you can drag and drop the icons around the Skyhawk to change where they're going to deploy at the start of the mission. You can also right click on them to change their orientation so they can face out of the side doors as you land, giving you instant vision on any threats to either side of the aircraft. This is a pretty huge tip that I missed for a long time. Also, I'm sure you're aware of this, but the numbers of the soldiers in the Skyhawk represent the numbers in the list here. So for example, if I want both of my shields at the front here when they get out of the Skyhawk, I need to move eight and nine to these positions here, and I'll have both of my shield units at the door. So I'm right-clicking to get the face the right way, and then I can have, see my heavy here looking out this way if I want them like that. So just be aware that the numbers also represent how they're lined up on the Skyhawk list. The Mars Combat Platform has a few interesting configurations to it, the default being with a rifle that has very low accuracy for, and a rocket launcher that can actually salvo fire if you really want to wreck a wall or something like that. Bear in mind you can give it more armor by clicking the heavy steel plating button here rather than using the drop down where you might assume to get armor. That does give it a time unit penalty. Um, additionally, you can change its loadout. It does come with a, a, a cannon as an alternate primary weapon, and it actually has equipable equipment as well. There is a smoke launcher if you want to go with smoke rounds instead of the rifle, and there is also a range finder, which does give it an accuracy boost if you want to set it up so that this is some sort of sniper vehicle. I would, however, recommend that you bear in mind that whilst the Mars is worth a lot of money, Rookies can eventually get better than the Mars in terms of stats, and killing aliens with the Mars removes the rookie's ability to gain promotions or even medals for killing aliens, slowing down their growth. So I feel the Mars is better in a support role where it's destroying cover and opening up avenues for fire for your troopers rather than getting the kills itself. You can also use it for cover in a similar way to a shield soldier, and it's pretty fine to do so until it runs out of armor. At that point, I would be very wary of doing so. 
One huge advantage this unit does have, it does have a lot of turn un time units. It's very, very mobile, and that is quite useful. I would say, however, that the ballistic auto rifle that it has is not particularly useful. I'm personally leaning towards giving it the smoke launcher going forward in my campaign. If you find yourself in a situation where you need to sell some items, be aware that every time you sell an item, the game it depreciates the value of the item, so the next time you'll sell it for less. So for example, if I sell one Sekton corpse here, I will get 10 grand, but the value of that corpse for the next time I sell it will go down to 9,750. However, if I sell in bulk, I will be able to sell all of those items for the current price without it going down between each sale, and then the price will go down. So example, if I was to sell four Sekton corpses, leaving with one, I would sell each of those for 9,750, and then the price would go down proportional to how many I sold. So if you're wanting to sell items from your store storeroom, first of all, never sell everything. Keep at least one. I would maybe not sell a lot to start with just because you don't know what it's going to be used for. But two, sell in bulk. Don't sell individually. And that should help you get more out of your sale. Here you can see that I've had my squad deploy to a battle, and because I preset my soldiers to face out the side doors, I've detected two aliens as soon as we've landed without needing to waste any turn units moving around or looking out the windows of my ship. You can see why this is a very, very useful thing to do. It's given me a whole ton of vision as soon as we start out and I can start beginning my planning without needing to take any risks at all to begin with. One of the most dangerous turns in a mission is actually, especially early game, is the first turn that you take. The reason for that is that the aliens on the map haven't moved or fired yet. Usually when you're encountering aliens during combat, they're moving around, they're engaging civilians, they're attacking your forces, and they're ending their turns having used some of their turn units up. But on the first turn, when you deploy out of the Sky Ranger, they haven't taken any actions before you move, which means they're sitting in cover and they're ready to deal Overwatch fire to you with their full turn units available to them. And if you do something hasty or unprepared, you can run your soldiers into death very, very quickly. For example, Anna Mulder here is in a prime position to possibly move forward to this piece of cover here. This looks like a decent spot to sit and engage this alien. And I'm gonna talk about this cover in a little bit more detail as well, because cover doesn't work the same way it does in, in other tactical strategy games like XCOM. Now, making this move will result in her taking reaction fire from both of these aliens, and I've already tested it. She will die if I run for this cover. Even doing something like throwing a smoke grenade has a chance for them to take reaction fire against her. For example, we got very lucky there that the alien missed because we actually threw the smoke grenade at him. But if we hand planned that out appropriately, we could have ended up in a situation where she took fire. That was actually a big risk that we took. Now, we did have a slight bonus because every square of smoke that a shot goes through is reduced accuracy by 20% on the shot. So the alien did have a pretty high accuracy penalty to shoot at her. Now, if we run her to this cover here, you can see the other alien gets a reaction shot against her. He also fired into the smoke and that reduced his chance to hit by 40%. But still, these are not great numbers. There's more we could have done to, to protect her this turn, but I'm just giving you this for example. We're now in cover behind this rock. And something that's really important for you to be aware of is if you have a look at the icon here, I'm just gonna hold it there, you can see the middle section is yellow and the two side corners are white. What this is telling me is that fire coming in from a very narrow angle directly in front of the rock is protected, but fire coming in from say a 45 degree angle off the center is not protected. So Anna here has no cover against this alien here, but she does have cover against this alien here. And this is a pretty big difference to something like XCOM, where being in a piece of yellow cover like this would protect you, unless you're using the aiming angles modifier, up to anyone coming up to an actual 90 degree angle to the cover. So she is only protected at a 45 degree angle to either, like it's very tight compared to what you're used to. And you need to watch out for that. Taking cover behind a wall, if I was to sit her in cover here, she would be protected from the front and the left side, but anyone along a 45 degree angle from the corner would be able to hit her. Whereas you might in your brain have trained yourself to think that if they're on the corner here, an enemy wouldn't be able to hit them unless they were on this line here. So that's very important to bear in mind. Cover is also very, very interesting. So for example, if I move our sniper to this position here, and try and shoot at this alien, actually I need them to be here for this demonstration, and try and shoot at this alien here, you can see that we're getting a minus 40% chance to hit from this pile of bricks here, 
and we're getting another minus 40% from them being behind cover here. Now, if we were to destroy those bricks, and take the same shot, you can see that there was an accuracy penalty being applied by the bricks, even though the, the alien wasn't behind them. So even though it's still hard to hit them, and it has been made easier by destroying the intervening cover, they still had an effect on the chance to hit. And you can use this to your advantage in combat by running directly at a piece of cover in a straight line with an alien behind it. If they are firing at you, there is a chance they will hit the cover as you're running towards it, even though you're not behind that cover. And that's something to bear in mind. Another thing to be aware of is that shields can be used as portable cover, even though the game doesn't really indicate that in a tooltip. So for example, if I was to move this sergeant here and crouch them down and then bring Corporal Jennifer up behind them, this is actually a defensive position in the same way that this rock is. Any shots fired at um, Jennifer Barry here will have a good chance to hit the shield instead, keeping her protected from fire. And because uh, Vitek here is crouching, she can fire over his head without an accuracy penalty. It's quite hard to kind of show you, but if I was to fire in this direction here, you can see that there's a 20% chance that the shot is going to hit the shield instead, which is about the same as light cover. Um, this is this is harder cover. So the, the cover mechanics are just a little bit tricky and you need to keep your mind kind of on a swivel on how they work. Don't assume that because you're behind a wall like this, you're protected on all sides. This angle here is completely unprotected for Corporal Pizzola here. So an alien coming around this corner will have an open shot on both of these soldiers as though they weren't in cover. And they'll also have a shot on um, Jennifer here if they were behind these bricks here. So you have to watch those 45 degree angles, not just the 90 degree angles. An additional important feature of the game is crouching. You can spend four units, four turn units to make a unit crouch. When they're crouching, the enemy get a 20% penalty to hit them. You should be crouching all of your soldiers before firing at an alien if you have the turn units to do it. And I would maybe recommend, especially early game, if you don't have the turn units to do it, don't fire, crouch instead, and fire at them next turn. That 20% chance to miss is very, very strong. There is an additional thing to be aware of, however. If we look at this alien here with our sniper, currently 31% chance to hit. If I throw a flashbang at this alien, now flashbangs are very good because what a flashbang will do is it will wipe out all of the remaining turn units that an affected target has on it and it will suppress it for the next turn, which means it will have it'll only gain half of its turn units back. So if you flash an enemy, you don't need to worry about overwatch fire and it won't be able to move and shoot as much as normal. But if I flash this enemy, He's been suppressed. You can see that he's now crouching. It's a bit hard to see from the angle, but he is now crouched down. And if I put my mouse over with a sniper, the chance to hit has been reduced because the aliens also gained the crouching bonus from being suppressed or just from taking the crouch action. So the enemies will also be able to crouch to get that 20% chance to hit. So you have to toss up sometimes on whether you want to take a shot before you flashbang the alien so that it's not 20% harder to hit them, or if you're going to flashbang them first to make sure you're not taking return fire. Bear in mind that the suppressed status will also be applied to enemies that take a lot of physical fire. So if you're firing at them with a heavy weapon, for example, or if you're firing at them with a lot of rifle fire, they will get suppressed and they will crouch down, making them harder to hit with consecutive shots. Another use for smoke is to actually stun enemies. If you build up enough stun damage on an enemy, they will fall unconscious. And if you extract from the mission, you'll bring the unconscious enemy with you and you'll be able to interrogate them in your research lab, which can unlock some pretty big bonuses. So doing this as early as possible is a huge advantage. Now you do unlock equipment that makes it easier to stun enemies as the campaign progresses. But right from the first mission, you can stun enemies with smoke grenades. What you need to do is wound them so that their health goes down. That means it will take less stun damage to stun them. It's proportional to their health. So this uh, sect on here who has been injured only requires 10 stun damage to be knocked unconscious. What you need to do is encourage the enemy to actually move through the smoke. And as they do so, they will take additional stun damage and will hopefully be knocked unconscious. So what I'm going to do here is going to drop a smoke grenade right on top of this guy if I can. He's already taken five stun damage from that exploding on him. Then you need to move units so that they're not easy shots for the aliens to fire at because they would prefer to stand and shoot in this situation if they can. So we're gonna move Anna here and I'm just gonna move um, this character here as well. So no one can now see this alien um, and that should put it in a position where it's going to get 
knocked unconscious when it moves through the smoke on its turn. So we just check out the corner here. We can see the alien has moved, but doesn't seem to have fallen unconscious. No, there it is there. Um, it's hard to see, but you can see this corpse. That's the unconscious alien that has been knocked unconscious from moving through the smoke. If we were to then extract from this mission, we would get an unconscious alien to take with us, and we can use that to, to get an interrogation, basically, in the first week of the campaign. You can also use this strategy to just throw smoke grenades into crashed UFOs and stand at the door, and the aliens will just have to run around in the smoke and either run out and get shot or fall unconscious inside, which will give you a bonus as well. So don't underestimate the power of a smoke grenade. Not only does it help your units move without taking fire, but it also can be used to knock an enemy out. One hugely important tip, if you accidentally give an order you didn't mean to or change your mind after clicking it, for instance, if I change my mind on this move order, if you right click at any time during the move, it'll cancel the move at that point. So just to demonstrate, I'm gonna click here, and now I'm gonna right click, and the soldier will stop where they were, saving you the turn units and letting you rethink what you were doing. When you encounter your first UFO, it'll be time for your first aerial combat. There's a few ways to take on aerial combat. I'll show you two very basic attack strategies that you can use for this, as well as giving you an overview on how it works. Um, obviously, you'll have your two aircraft ready to go in your starting base. You can launch a squadron of three max at a time if you build another little hangar. I'll just... Just to explain the um, rules here, the tail over land option is very important if you are if you find the UFO over water. You do not want to engage it over water. Doing so means the UFO will fall into the water and you won't be able to recover any equipment or supplies or corpses from it. So make sure you tail target until over land if it is over water. Just very quickly to explain what the special abilities do here, um, the roll left and roll right options are used to try and evade enemy fire. The most important one to be aware of is the afterburner toggle. This will increase the speed of your aircraft. However, doing so will also mean that the aircraft cannot fire while afterburners is turned on. So bearing aware of that. Now, there are two different sort of early game strategies that I see being to take on a scout. The first is very aggressive. Um, what you do is you set one, you let both of your aircraft fire their sidewinders by just unpausing. Them. Once they've fired them, you set one to use its afterburners to get ahead of the second aircraft. It's going to be your tank for this engagement. It's usually the one that the UFO turns towards. Then when you get into combat range, turn the afterburner off so they could fire. At this point, you could afterburner the second one just to get it in a little bit closer and you're basically going to do a fly past. It will split its fire between both of them. And that's a shoot down with very minimal damage on both planes. It seems like it's very, very aggressive, and it is, but it is quite a good strategy. I'll show you the other strategy just now. The second option has a higher potential to reduce the damage to your aircraft, but I find it very hard to pull off. Same as before, unpause the game so that your aircraft both launch their sidewinders. They have a minimum activation range that seems on the sidewinders. So you want to find them before you do anything. And look at which aircraft the enemy is moving towards. Get the other one to afterburn towards the scout and get the one that it is turning towards to turn away from it. This is what you're planning to do is to get it to basically get into a chase. And what will happen though is the alien will react to that. So you might need to swap back. I'm going to turn the afterburner off on Angel 1 turn it off on Angel 2 and get Angel 2 to turn away from the Scout. Your aircraft are a lot faster than the Scout. Oops, Angel 1 needed its orders to be reset. Um, but the, the Scout can kind of turn very tightly on a very thin axis. So it's currently chasing Angel 2. It's now changed targets back to Angel 1. You'll need to do this a little bit. So turn the afterburner off here, turn the afterburner on here, and turn Angel 1 away from the Scout. And eventually you'll be able to sneak a plane in behind it. So again, we're in this position here. I'm going to keep Angel 2 turning away with the afterburner on. I'm going to keep Angel 1 coming in with the afterburner on. There's a lot more micro involved in this strategy, and it can it can go catastrophically wrong if you're not paying attention to what the scout is doing. You see it's turning back towards Angel 1 now. I want Angel 1 to kind of tuck in behind a little bit so it doesn't turn back too early. Now I need to turn Angel 1 away and just make sure that we don't get in. Angel 2 is coming in perfectly behind the scout. We want it to sit behind it if we can. The, the scout is now actually turning in on Angel 2, 
So we need to change digital to, I'm going to turn off its afterburner. I want it to cut in about here. Actually, we want to keep the afterburner on for a little bit longer. Basically until we get into attack range. And now that we're in attack range, we can attack. And Angel 1 is coming in for an attack as well. And what we can do at this point here is use an evasive roll to the left to get out of the scout's attack area. It's turning towards us, so we are taking a little bit more damage. Angel 1 is almost in range. Angel 2 is currently out of range because I've told it to turn out of the combat. We can bring it in again and then do another evasive roll to the left. Turn off the afterburner on Angel 1 so it's ready to fire. As soon as we're ready, we'll do another evasive roll on Angel 2. And that should bring it... Oh, I rolled the wrong way, but you get the picture of what's supposed to happen here. And that's a shoot down there. So it's kind of similar on the damage. If I micro did a bit better, we may have ended up in a situation where Angel 2 took less damage. That is another viable combat strategy. I'm not as good as it. I prefer the first one. We took hardly any damage on it. But that kind of shows you the kind of ways that you can do it. So hopefully that's been useful. One last thing to talk about. When you get alien mag weapons researched, you unlock the accelerated weapons for your primary, for your soldiers. There is another weapon that gets unlocked that isn't actually included in this report. Um, if we go into the uh, engineering section here, you do now have the access to the accelerated cannon as well, which is an improved weapon for your aircraft. You can see here it does seven damage with one armor penetration, and it destroys half an armor per shot with a 0.25 second reload time and a range of three. If we check here, the um, cannon that is currently equipped does five damage with no armor penetration. So it's just a better gun. Um, and I think there's not controversy, but there's definitely a debate already happening on whether the accelerated stage is worth investing heavily in. I would definitely think about getting accelerated cannons for your aircraft as an early upgrade to make them just take down those small UFOs a little bit faster. My shout here is that an accelerated sniper rifle is probably always going to be useful. Um, accelerated shotguns maybe don't really matter that much. If you can afford some accelerated rifles, they will help. Uh, but you maybe don't need to go all in on this tier because laser weapons isn't too far behind. Personally, for my primary campaign, I'm probably going to invest heavily in accelerated weapons just to try them out. But future campaigns, I may skip over it to go to lasers. That's kind of all of the stuff I wanted to go over in this video. Just some things to show you, some basic tips to get you going, things that I've learned the hard way in my Let's Play campaigns so far. Hopefully it's been useful. If I've missed anything and you want to share it with the community, please take a second to pop it in the comments below. Uh, I really like to see all the different things people have found and are doing. There's so many different ways to play the game, it seems. And it's really, really fun so far. So again, thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a good time. If you don't have Xenonauts 2 and would like to pick it up, check the description of the video. I have an affiliate link in there for gamesplanet.com where you can pick the game up at quite a considerable discount at this point. Um, and and that, might, so that also supports the channel if you want to do that. If you do like my videos, don't forget to like and subscribe. It does let me know that I'm making stuff that you want to see. And I will catch you in the next video. Ciao for now.